if you're going to carry a gun, carry it everywhere you can. You know, everywhere you can legally, um, everywhere you can practically. If you're making decisions about, oh, you know, uh, I'm going to I'm going to go to the mall today, so I'm going to carry my gun. Like, well, maybe that's a sign you just shouldn't go to the mall. <laughs>All right, everybody, we are coming in hot. Mark's got an entire ream of paper on the table right now, uh, printed out from what appears to be various different forms of Wikipedia and other outlets. Uh, We also have, this is not being brought to you by MC Ryan, as usual. This is being brought to you by MC, still not the right use of the term MC. That's all right. Uh, MC Brittany and Cooper are on the other sides of the camera and all of this audio equipment. So uh, they have been briefed by Ryan, so hopefully our audio will still sound good. If it doesn't, you know who to blame. Across the table from Mark and I, though, uh, are Adrian, who has been with us before. He is the head instructor down there at Vortex Edge, which has come up. He was in our pod venture on a bunch of different self-defense, home defense sort of things. And a new guest to the Vortex Nation podcast, Chris Urutia. Yes. I had to... Just give it to us. I had to picture it in my head when you wrote it down in very... It's pronounced Chris. <laughs> Chris. Kind of rolls off the tongue a little bit. That does. Yeah, yeah. The, the last name is still a mystery. Chris U. Apparently Spanish. Yep. And it stands for fine ham. Yes. Really? Mm. Like no, a, it doesn't. That's what you said <laughs> yeah. this morning. Now I sound like an idiot. No, no. Now I already sound like an idiot half the time on the same. I'm so. Anyway. Into, I'm not going to be able to stop thinking about this until we just. Get, we can you just to, say? Can you just it. say your? Well, it, it, if, you, if you pronounce it in Spanish, is Rutia. Oh, Ooh. gotta roll that R. Yeah, now but it's at, better. but at this point in English, has been pronounced so many different ways throughout my my entire life. I don't even know the correct pronunciation. So okay, hmm. yeah. Well, now we know the cool way to say it. It's yeah. very, yeah. very exotic sounding when you say it, Chris. It yep. is, yeah. Yep. I'm going to start practicing. I'll be here. I'll be here, guys. Well, <laughs> yep. Chris is another one of the instructors, though, down at Vortex Edge. And so a lot of what we talk about when uh, people are going to be coming through taking classes there, if uh, if you don't see that just yet, too, on the website, just stay tuned. It's going to happen very soon. You can sign up for stuff. Uh, but pistols are a big thing. And a lot of times when people are coming to learn different fundamentals with shooting a pistol, they are probably going to try and relate it to things like, you know, maybe use in home defense or uh, it could be competition, other things like that. But home defense and concealed carry are two very big things right now, uh, certainly. And when we think concealed carry, there's a whole lot that goes along with that. We actually, we did talk about it a little bit in that pod venture. Uh, that we did. Now, there's there's so much that goes into it, and we're going to kind of stick to more uh, gear-related stuff here. Uh, but the gear is important, what you use. And in terms of, like, carry styles, like holsters that you might use, um, and just, you know, where you're carrying the firearm on your person or off your person. So there's on-body and off-body carry. We're going to kind of go into all those different things here. And you guys can correct me if I'm right. You guys can go into this, certainly. I don't know if we're going to, like, in this podcast where it's like this is definitively the style you should do but more or less like here's the pros and cons of each one am i right at right. least in assuming that yeah i think so because it, it's going to vary for everybody yeah well and i think also looking at my uh, list of potential methods there might be some that you might want to steer people away from that that could happen more than likely um, so anyway, uh, certainly, I mean, you know, the idea of concealed carrying pistol on your, uh, on your person, um, where do you guys start with that with people who are coming in and just, I mean, probably just thinking about beginning to conceal carry, or maybe they have a little bit, but they're not quite certain they like the method they're using. What do you guys say to people like that? Oh man. I mean, there's a lot of places, a lot of places you can, uh, you can start. Uh, you know, the first thing I like to talk about is, uh, what is their mission for, for carrying a gun? What What is the reason that they want to carry one? You know, is it, uh, you know, self-defense, protecting their family? Are they looking to carry everywhere? Do they just want an option? Uh, in the middle of the night, they can throw on their hip and, uh, you know, investigate a bump in the night, things like that. Um, so, you know, understanding why you're carrying, what your goals are with it. Um, you got to have a holster. Uh, equipment is, is very important. Got to have a holster that works, that's safe. Um, that's going to retain the firearm when you want to keep in the holster. That's going to allow you to draw the firearm quickly. Um, and then, of course, you know, where in your body uh, you want to carry it, and that's going to kind of vary for everybody. But there's Is that all just kind of based on personal preference? So if I'm thinking about, like, you know, if I'm trying to choose between there's appendix style, 
which I'll, I remember when I first got my firearm, I was like, there's no way in hell I'm carrying it that way. That just feels way too uncomfortable. You know, then there's kind of off in the hip at like a three or like a just four or whatever clock position. I had to go on my clock there, my mental analog clock. Um, you know, on the hip, uh, is that a personal preference thing? Is that like a comfort thing? Is that a, how, are there advantages tactically speaking to, to, one over the other? Or? Yeah, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. I think some of it does come down to, to uh, personal preference, but there are advantages and disadvantages. Um, I guess if we look at like the two, maybe starting off, the two most, I would say, common or popular on-body carry options with a holster are probably um, inside the waistband, behind the strong side hip, so mm-hmm. like that, you know, 4 o'clock, 4.30 position, um, and then inside the waistband appendix. Um, so kind of up, uh, just, you know, in front of your belly at like, you know, either noon or, or I guess that'd be one o'clock. Um, you know, there's some pros and cons for both. Uh, I think most people when they're new to carrying a gun, start carrying it behind their strong side hip. Mm-hmm. Um, I think people feel a little bit safer with it because of the way the gun is oriented. It's not pointing at vital parts of your body, <laughs> especially if you're a dude. Um, <clears throat> and people just feel probably starting off a little bit safer, uh, with that. Um, that said, it's a little bit slower to draw than an appendix. Uh, it's a little bit harder to keep an eye on it and see, you know, if you're printing, if your shirt's caught on, caught, uh, on your holster and things like that. Switching over to an appendix carry, um, it's a lot faster, I found. Um, it's nice in, in some ways and, and kind of the reason eventually why I went from a, uh, inside the waistband behind the strong side hip to an appendix carry is because I realized, um, as I'm holstering, like I can look that gun all the way into my holster and I can make sure I don't have my shirt, you know, jamming into a uh, trigger guard or anything like that. So for me, that was kind of the final hurdle. I was like, you know what? Yeah, I think I think I can do this very safely hmm. um, and just a little bit easier to, to keep track of instead of you see, especially new people who are carrying to get out of your, their car and they'll be pulling their shirt down all the time because they're a little self-conscious that their gun is there. You know, with a, an appendix in the front of your body, you just glance down. Yeah, my gun's covered. It's all good. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, those are some of the some of the pros and cons. So, there's definitely some things to consider. I know I've done very minimal of both, but I I feel like when you know you're carrying on that whatever o'clock, right? You know, behind you a little bit. At least mentally, I do feel like the muzzle is less pointed just at me, which I think is always a little bit more comfortable. I mean, with the appendix, I mean. It's kind of right in there. And, and like you said, I think that is more a mental hur- hurdle to get over. Yeah, you kind of got I mean, like every time I've gotten a new holster, I do at least try it a few times. Because sometimes there's different tensions that you can do. And, you know, like you at least uh, with, a, with a dry chamber and everything, you know, mag inserted, you, you kind of almost, uh, quote, do dry firing of just holstering the pistol and make sure that it's not somehow grabbing on something. But, I mean, there's so many safety mechanisms in the pistols that when you actually think about what it would take in order for it to go off, especially yeah. when in a holster and that whole trigger guard area is covered up, it's it's pretty extensive, am I right? Yeah, and that's why I like carrying something more um, like a Glock that where, uh, you know, the the striker isn't in a cocked position. You actually have to pull the trigger to uh, to load that striker oh, under yeah. tension as the opposed th- to there's some other striker-fired pistols that are... Kind of act more like a single action pistol almost, you know, where it's where it's always um, the striker's under tension. And, you know, you've heard some stories about guns going off lately um, and various recalls yeah. that supposedly triggers haven't been pulled. So um, until all that gets sorted out, you know, that's why I kind of stick to a, a certain, mm-hmm. bit, you know, pistol or two. Mm-hmm. Would that be something you would recommend? Like if a person's new to concealed carry, whatever method they choose, like carrying that gun? empty for a few days just to get a feel for it is that a, is, would that be a good practice is that not a good practice should you not have an empty gun with you like could that be <laughs> kind of a problem too i don't know you have to think about where you're ultimately going to train to right do you want to have two you want, do you want to train to two different scenarios you know this is how i'm going to draw and sh- and cock and shoot a gun that's empty or do i want to invest the time and effort and repetitions into developing one neural pathway and this is the way i'm going to do it every time Mm -hmm. i I would recommend just getting used to handling your firearm safely with a round in chamber i mean that's just yeah i'm not uh, i'm not a big fan of the the chamberless carry yeah uh if you're asking like carrying a completely empty gun to kind of get used to it you know for a while um 
you know, nothing in the uh, chamber, nothing in the magazine, just to get used to the carry position, stuff like that. That's I, what I was, yeah. you know, like, oh, man, like, holy mackerel, my shirt got caught, yeah. you know. Do I, I, do I want to practice that with an empty gun yeah, versus... When I was new and inexperienced, when I first got a concealed carry permit way back in the day and, and started carrying, that's, you know, what I did for a, a whole week, carried it around and just like, okay, you know, mm-hmm. got comfortable with the idea. I mean, I, mean, I so. guess that's like a good sort of topic to get on as well. I mean, before we even dive in a ton on like which holsters to look at and types of holsters and all that, it's just at what point do you think somebody, it's different for every single person. And if you're listening to this and, and like we can't give a hard, fast rule because like it's really impossible to tell any single person like, yes, you are officially good to go on Vortex's account by listening to the Vortex Nation podcast. <laughs> you are good. No, that's not at all what we're saying. Do not Do not think that. Legal guy is probably, if he listens to this, he's probably like rolling over right now. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, at what point generally do you think people, like, what should they have gone through at least to be competent enough to even carry in any of these fashions? Um, I think at least some formal level of, of training where you're, you're being taught the nomenclature and just how to be familiar and safe with your firearm. Like, mm-hmm. that would be like an like introduc- introductory pistol class where you learn you know don't put your finger here obviously you know this is the way you you know a a proper loading procedure and just becoming really familiar with that firearm that you've chosen and and i would definitely say that's a hardcore step one yeah i'd agree that for sure and i'd even expand on that i would say uh i I would really encourage people to go to just a, a general pistol shooting class where they're starting to do holster work, not from a concealed holster, but starting out with just a, uh, a straight drop outside the waistband, kydex holster, and uh, just getting used to drawing that manner where they can see the gun. They don't have to worry about their shirt when they're reholstering, things like that. Mm-hmm. And when you have that down and you feel like, yeah, I'm, I feel pretty good drawing and reholstering and things like that, I think at that point then we can start looking at, all right, now I want to you know, carry concealed. How should I go about doing that? Um, yeah, because I mean, we see a lot of students that come through, and um, a lot of people have have got a lot of shooting experience. They're good pistol shooters, but they their their pistol shooting consists of them going out to a range. They take their gun out of the bag, they set it on the table, they shoot, and maybe they shoot great groups, but they never work on weapon manipulations, they never work on presentations, holster work, reloads, things like that. And you have to have, you got to be fairly comfortable, I think with the weapon handling before you start carrying concealed. Mm -hmm. Because as we mentioned too in that uh, series that we did a while back, you can never expect yourself to somehow magically get better when everything goes completely wrong. Yep. That's that's when you're magically going to get worse, if anything. Yeah. Um, Well, and that's the ultimate scenario of everything is happening at once. And when we were doing that training with you guys, which was like just so valuable, um, it's like we'd, we'd start here. And then you need to add in another layer, add in another layer. And man, just the addition of one extra thing, like you'd be like, oh, I'm getting this one thing down. And it fouls up the stuff that you just like started getting right, you know, and you got to learn it with that extra, I don't know. It, mm-hmm. yeah. and, and like you said, Jim, when it goes, if it goes down, which hopefully it never does, right? But that's all the layers. You have to be able to do all of the gun stuff subconsciously without thinking of it. You got to be able to draw, you know, handle your weapon, get it into the fight find your sight, shoot, all that stuff without thinking about it because you're going to have to be thinking about, am I justified in shooting somebody? Um, where do I got to move? What's my backdrop? You know, are there innocent people here? Do I got to do something with my kids? Like your brain's going to be processing all that stuff. You can't think, okay, how do I draw? Clear <laughs> my shirt, grab my gun, okay, sights, trigger, press. Like, no, you can't do that. Mm-hmm. Your brain can't focus on all that stuff at once, especially under stress. Yeah. My brain can't focus on like, brushing my teeth and clipping my toenails at the same time <laughs> in a controlled environment. Mm-hmm. I just, yeah, I just had a mental meltdown there just thinking about that. It's Jim. pretty tough. If you haven't tried it, you should at least try it and see what your <laughs> mental capacity is. Um, okay. Like I said, we probably should have gone over that almost first, but it is it is good to bring up either way. But, but I do think that those styles we were talking about in relation back to kind of the gear and the carry styles, those are probably the two most popular. Are there any... Other, oh, I know there are. There's plenty of others, but no. are there any other pretty notable on body carry solutions though that, that people are doing that are sort of, um, I don't want to totally just crap on any one of them by any means, you know, because Mark said there may be some that we just say right out, like, hey, maybe you avoid that one. And there may be some super odd scenario that somebody's got out there, like, no, this is the best for this reason. It could be totally legit. But are there some other ones that, that are out there that are either popular or that are just like, hey, avoid that one? Or I've got some we could crap on. I yeah. feel pretty good about that. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah. 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 
Um, small of the back carry. I think small of the back carry is a terrible idea. It's <laughs> it's it's hard to catch uh, to get your gun. Really hard to draw from. You don't have an ambidextrous draw. A lot of times, uh, you guys remember training with Kyle McNally. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. A lot of times in a fight, you wind up on your butt and falling backwards. Now you've got a gun over your lower spine, hard gun, and fall on that. That's not that's not good for you. Not very comfortable, um, to say the least. Hard to retain if you're in a physical fight and someone you're trying to retain a gun in your holster back there. Um, just not a good position overall. I mean, yeah, and also if, if your hands are preoccupied in front of you yep. and you're printing, it's it's so easy for someone to just come up behind you and and rip that thing out of there, yeah. and the gun's gone before you know it. Yeah, I could see, like, he, even growing up, my brother would, like, hold my arm behind my back sometimes. I mean, we actually, that, yeah. I mean, you're, like, starting in that position. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, essentially, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a very weak position to start from. It's a slow draw. Um, it's, it, like, I'll I'll just say it, don't carry small to the back. It's stupid. It doesn't yeah. work. Fair enough. And, I mean, Bad you bring idea. up. You bring up Chris the um, you know having somebody potentially rip that thing out of there. That's another thing that I think a lot of people don't always consider too when it comes to concealed carry is the fact that and I I love the way we did that training with Kyle the way he worded it. Oftentimes the only gun involved in the fight is the one that you brought. Yep. And um, you know you might get in a tussle or find yourself in a bad situation and the bad guy or gal or whoever it is may not have a gun, but if they get yours now they do. Yep. And if you brought that, I mean, that's some, that's some. I don't, I don't want to call that irony. That, that puts a little light to it, but right. uh, <laughs> in some ways, it kind of is, and not good. Yeah. Not the good. Well, current. that's crazy too. I mean, even in that situation, which sounds like not a good one, right? But still, the thought of presenting your farm may not have even crossed your mind yet. You're like, I don't mm -hmm. anticipate this ever getting to that level. But all of a sudden, it's there. That person maybe doesn't know your mindset, and now you've got. Totally really escalated you, everything. Right. Yeah. And then something there where you could have just gotten at least a, you know, your face punched in if you didn't know what you were doing in terms of hand to hand stuff, then you might have got shot. A lot, yeah. a lot of times, those physical confrontations, it'll start just physical. And then all of a sudden, guy touches your gun and you think he's going for your gun. Now you're trying to retain your gun. And now he thinks that you're going for your gun. Going, yeah. And now, now it's a gunfight. Yeah. Now you're both fighting for the gun. You're both fighting for your life. And it's just nobody intended it to get that far. So yeah, it comes back to what we talked about before in that uh, pod venture, like de-escalation, walk away if you can, stay out of the physical fights. Yeah, just to piggy piggyback on that, all the videos mostly that you see circulating like social media, I, I used to be big into just studying you know, videos of, of encounters, armed encounters with, with just, you know, between law enforcement, everyday carry kind of kind of stuff. And you see it time and time again where the the main injury that occurred first to lead into that situation was someone's pride got hurt. You know what I mean? Rather, oh, yeah. than, rather than just realizing a lot of times carrying the firearm puts you at more of a responsibility to just walk away. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like words – are just never a good excuse to get into an, a confrontation, especially if you are the armed person. Like, it's more a responsibility for you to walk away. Higher standard. Yep, absolutely. Yep, for sure. What, uh, That's why I don't carry a gun, I'm going to say what I want. <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you got some of them special words. That you can just <laughs> curl back and just completely incapacitate mm -hmm. them. I'm unarmed. I can insult you however I <laughs> feel. <laughs> One of the one of the other things with carrying, you know, when you're bringing up small of the back, or even when we were talking about the, uh, you know, 430, whatever, strong side behind the hip style of carry, um, they're really uncomfortable in a lot of common situ uh, like common situations you find yourself in, i.e., sitting. And I, that's the one thing that I know. When I started carrying, I started carrying, just like many people, behind that strong side hip. Finally, mustered the the courage slash just whatever it is to go to appendix, and it was mostly because I was having to go to the chiropractor a lot because my hips were all jacked up all the time. It was worse than even when I was carrying my wallet in my back pocket when I first started carrying a wallet. Um, that is brutal. Yeah, it can be. Yep. Yeah. Gun uh, gun selection and holster, you know, matters a lot, but at some point, yeah, I mean, sitting in the car, you know, now you're pressing back against that. That's uh, another reason I went to the appendix carry, and it's a lot easier to access uh, a firearm from an appendix carry in different positions yep. like that when you're seated. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. especially in your car. You know, you pop into your car, um, put your seatbelt on, and then, you know, pull your shirt over the seatbelt, and now you have free access to your firearm versus, you know, in a car with behind the waistband. I mean, you got to lean. you got to shift. 
it's just that's not okay. a, yeah. easy to get to. Yeah, yeah, I think I think for me the, the two biggest factors that I think about where and and how I'm and what I'm going to carry is defendability and accessibility, right? So if if I need to be able to get to it with either hand, and I need to be able to keep it in the holster or reholster with both hands, right? Mm-hmm. And that's that's kind of why I landed on on the appendix carry. Um, you know, doing red man in like in the in the academy, you know, we get we get the the snot wrung out of us, and all we have is our one hand, which is which ends up being your support hand because I'm I'm burying my gun into my my hip essentially, and I mean everything else is, I mean he's got two hands and I've got my one, um, so it really it really shows you like what you can get away with and, and how defendable your your carry solution is, and that's why I I like appendix because I can bury it with my 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 left hand and now I've got my my strong hand available to me. Maybe we are going to leave this one saying just do appendix. I don't know. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> you know, I, I think if you're a competent gun handler, if you're experienced, I, I've kind of, um, for the most part, I kind of think it's it's the uh, I think it's the best all around position. I really do. It's not for everybody, uh, depending on your your body style. If you carry more weight up front, it might not be real comfortable for you. Mm-hmm. Um, but I found it works pretty good for men and women. Um, and l- like I said, you know, you, there's a little bit of a mental hurdle you got to you got to get after, uh, get over. Uh, when you're holstering and things like that, you got to be real careful. But um, you know, you handle that. I think there's a ton of advantages to it. I really yeah. Do. I know that one of the mundane parts of our job down at the range is is harping on the safety rules. But I I, I always say it. There's some level of practicality behind every single safety rule that we we implement, and there's a reason for it. It isn't just because we're on a flat range and we won't, we don't want you to shoot yourself. But I mean, every single safety rule can be applied to the real world. You know, keeping your finger straight enough to trigger until you're ready to fire. Like you're not ready to fire if you're reholstering or, or getting on the trigger too soon on a draw. Like, it, it, I mean, it, uh, whenever we preach safety, like we give real world situations where, hey man, this you this can carry over to defending yourself. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you know, even if you're familiar with firearms, right? Maybe you've shot you know, ARs or bolt guns or, you know, I guess rifles, right? Um, and you're familiar with the safety rules, like maybe even intimately. It just seems like they're easier to break with a pistol. Yeah, I mean, it's a smaller barrel. It's a shorter barrel, right? It's it's easier to flag yourself. Um, you know, yeah, you're right. I mean, the the I think the size is a big one. Yeah, you just rifle. don't notice it as much. With exactly. ri- yeah, rifles are just, they're, they're just... It's more very cumbersome. So very like, obvious yeah. if you're pointing a gun at somebody with a rifle. With a pistol, it's a lot easier to accidentally flag someone. Just a minute angle yeah. change and yeah. But I mean, even with the the appendix thing, I mean, the one thing I like about it is right. Especially, I'm, so I'm carrying an appendix holster right now. This is a, a Glock that I uh, have unloaded. If you want to double check that. So you know, even even if I if I have my firearm out right and uh, I'm still not comfortable, right? I can pop that off. You know, oh, you've got one with the yeah, buttons. You know, and I can, without flagging anything, it's in there. Mm-hmm. Now I can tuck it in and pop it back on. So, gotcha. you know, uh, that's one way to kind of get around that. But like yeah. I said, I mean, it's just, if I'm reholstering this gun here, right, I can I can look it in. I can see that, you know, my finger's off the trigger. Um, there's nothing in my in my holster to, to snag the trigger guard. And um, versus even, even me carrying a long time, you know, behind the uh, waistband, Sometimes a shirt gets caught in there. It's it's harder to see back there. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it seems like you guys are pretty set. You know, you kind of maybe gone through this this path and just you know ended on appendix carry. And you guys are pretty set on it. Is there is there ever a time or a circumstance where you carry a different way or an alternative way due to whatever time of year, weather, the clothing you have on, you know, um, things yeah, like that? Yeah, I think for for me, I, I mean, I. <laughs> I get made fun. I got made fun of down at the range, but I mean, I carry this way whenever I'm like off body, off body, right? So if I'm going to the gym, you know, where I don't have all I have is a drawstring, or I don't know, I'm, I'm going out with the kids and I plan on being on my feet for an extended period of time, where I have tons of layers that I can't defeat very quickly, then I carry this on on my outside. Okay, um, it doubles as my 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 dad bag or you know my diaper bag, and I keep diapers and applesauce and all sorts of stuff in here and this is probably the only other way that i, I allow myself to carry a gun okay in a vehicle out of vehicle just it's either on me or it's it's in the bag 
I mean, that's, you know, I mean, you hate to live life, you know, thinking of the boogeyman, right? But I was thinking about that, you know, like you're talking about being active, like people like to run. Well, if you go on a long run, you're in the country, you're isolated, you're by yourself, you're maybe, you know, susceptible to a threat. I mean, I think these things are, ha- fortunately happen rarely, but, you know, those possibilities exist, you know, and like if you're being super active like that, is that off body? Is that kind of your best op- option or are there still like on body yeah. type carries when you are, you know, exercising at that yeah. type of level? I mean, there's a lot of options. Um, you know, you can carry, there's some, I, I don't have any, any here, uh, but there's some like, uh, uh tight fitting, uh, elastic style shirts, you know, yeah. that, uh, are you know, like oh, the compression, okay. like an under armor yeah. type, um, uh, five eleven makes some, there's some other companies. Uh, there's an elastic, like a belly band that you know, is pretty good for running. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, carrying a smaller pistol too, I, I generally try to carry a decent sized gun, but sometimes, um, you know, sometimes if I, I'm just wearing shorts and a T-shirt or something like that, you know, it, I might take something smaller. Um, I got a little Smith & Wesson bodyguard there that sometimes just gets thrown in a, in a little pocket holster in the, in you know, in my pocket, you know. Okay. No, I, and I, and I same thing. I have a, we have a Glock 43 at home. Yeah. And it has a single clip appendix holster. I'll just run that through my sweatpants, tie the drawstring about, around that, and I'm, I'm good to go. Yeah. Yeah, what do you get? What do you think about the pocket holster style thing, Adrian? Because that one, that one, yeah. there's some. I don't know if it's a controversy around it, but I know some people argue around that. Like, usually it's just sort of in your pocket. Like, well, yeah, you definitely want to carry it in a holster, um, right? So there's pocket specific holsters, right? Is yeah, that what you're yeah, usually exactly. using? Or? And I thought I had one here. I actually don't. This one, this one, it's kind of like this. This is a, a leather. This one's got a clip on it. So a pocket holster might just look something like that. Right. It's real small. A lot of times it's got like a sticky material on the outside. So when you draw, um, the holster stays in your pocket and the whole thing doesn't come out. But the idea is really just to cover the trigger guard and break up the outline. Because if you, especially if you're wearing, well, even jeans or khakis or something like that, you're carrying a gun around in your pocket. Like, especially if you wear the same pants every day, eventually you get that (laughs) imprint of the gun on your pocket. So not very covert. So, mm-hmm. um, again, it's an option. You know, the big thing is uh, carried in the same place. Don't throw your keys and a bunch of other junk in that same pocket. You know, don't keep sticks of bubble gum and things like that in there. Yeah. So, but it, it's an option. You know, obviously you're limited to a smaller gun. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, going back to the uh, to the off body, I feel like with a lot of these. So, Chris, how often do you do you practice with your off body carry just as much as you practice with your appendix and other stuff? Or because I feel like if you're going to be switching it up a lot, like the one thing that I wouldn't really want to do so much is just have ten different styles of of carry that I'm switching between. Where, like you're saying, Mark, there's all these different scenarios you might find yourself in. But if I'm finding myself where okay, today I'm appendix, the next day I'm behind the strong hip, and the next day I'm off body, and then I'm carrying pocket style. There's all these different things that like yeah, that's you a- have no repeatable motor skill that you're like always intuitively right there for you know what i mean you know that kind of variances might be okay if you're like god where did i set my car keys but it's a little <laughs> bit different when it's your pistol yeah where's my gun on my body again yeah if, if i'm being honest with myself i have three main styles of ca- i carry a gun in my daily life i don't i don't kick doors anymore i don't i don't have to do anything cool right um so Mark, you still do that yeah 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 i mean i don't like to talk about it that much sorry actually sorry. You, you can't <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the thing. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, no, but yeah, yeah. So it's either appendix carry, right? If I'm if I'm going to and from work, or if I'm going to the store to get chocolate milk for the kids on the way home, or something like that. It's it's on my person. Um, if I'm going to the gym, or if again I'm with the kids and I need to carry diapers or or whatever, any accoutrement of of an outing, I'm taking this guy and the guns probably in here with it. Um, and the only other place i really have to worry about carrying a gun is like during competition or at, at a course where it's on, on my hip oh you know what okay. I mean? so those are the three main places um you I, I find that between the bag and the appendix there's a lot of continuity there as, as to where the bag ends up and where i start to draw from oh because right? you swing it around to your front almost exactly. like a fanny pack yep, and I can, yeah um so when i when i draw this thing from this holster oh damn so it ends up Kind of right here in front of my body, just above where my where I would draw it append- from from the appendix, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so I don't have to invest a lot of uh, different tactics or, or, or so to speak to draw the handgun from that position. Uh, and with and it, and the beauty of it, of this system is that I can take this entire 
system and attach that to my belt at work. And now that's how I carry it classes and that this is what I instruct from. Oh, right on. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So then I, at the end of the day, I can take this off and just put it back in my bag and, and go. Yeah. yeah like so, you said, I mean, it's, there's a lot of continuity yeah. there. Yeah. I definitely feel that somebody starting out should try to pick one method and stick yes. with it. Um, that said, yeah, sometimes, um, I mean, I mentioned the pocket holster. Sometimes if I'm carrying somewhere where I need to wear a suit, I've got an inside the waistband holster that uh, has tuckable clips, so I can actually tuck my dress shirt in over it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, But that kind of limits me to carrying behind the hip. Um, that said, so like I said, try to limit, you know, have, have that one spot if possible. Um, but at the same time, I think part of it too comes goes back to your awareness, right? Um, if I get caught off guard and I have to react quickly to something, um, things, uh, I I can't process things in the same manner as if I see a threat coming and I can start making a mental plan and, and, and prep in my head. Right. So if Chris jumps up real quick with a knife and tries to stab me, it's going to be total reactionary. Right. But if I see a dude, Chris uh, is walking into the gas station where I'm at and he's casing the place out, like. I'm starting to make a plan, move. I'm thinking, I'm indexing my firearm. Okay, you know, where am I carrying it? You know, and I start going through this mental rehearsal to get me ahead of the game. So I don't want to say that carrying in multiple different spots is an absolute no-no. You can make it work. Yeah. Um, but I think you got to be a little bit more up on your awareness game um, and things like that. I think, especially for for, for professionals and people who carry guns every day, is it's it's an inev- uh, it's inevitable. Like you're gonna have to carry. As a cop, I carried. You know, I had to carry outside the waistband, 3 o'clock, but then I did plain clothes stuff, so I had to carry concealed. And then I'm off duty, and I'm carrying in a different manner. So, you know, depending That's on what you do, yeah, you're going to have to find a couple different options that work for you. Every option I'm sure that you wind up doing or you could find yourself in, you've at least probably thought about, you know, like done a little bit of training with it or something. Because yeah. I feel like if you just went out and you're like, oh, well, I'm going to get this holster, and I'm going to get this thing, and this thing, and that thing, and you're kind of like, yeah, and then when I do that, I'm just going to like put it on and stick my gun in there and then go. I mean, if you have no idea necessarily how it's all going to work in a real life scenario, that would be that yeah. would be where you'd find yourself maybe wanting to rethink that a bit. Yeah, you got to get some reps in, especially if you want your draw to be efficient, fast, consistent. I mean, you got to practice it. Yeah. Yeah, from each position. Run to the range with your little compression thing on, <laughs> so then you're already tired and sweating, and then you just like show up, run up to the firing line, shoot a few shots, everyone's wondering what's going on, and then you run off. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, that guy's very athletic and <laughs> accurate. <laughs> Um, Speaking of athletics, so we're talking a little bit about the running and like, you know, it seems like even styles these days for men are a little bit more form fitting, right? Like, um, and then, you know, I guess at least right now it appears to me as an observation, like, you know, women's clothing is pretty form fitting, you know, a lot. How, how is a person navigating? You navigated that that pretty well. Speaking of navigating. Thank you. (laughs) Well done. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, you don't want to be like, you know, just running around like, I got a gun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, you got to consider if, if you make the decision to carry every day, you got to consider your wardrobe. I mean, I, I, okay. carrying appendix or inside the waistband, like I've got to buy my pants two inches, you know, a size bigger, basically. Mm-hmm. It's something you got to consider. Hmm. Um, you know, yeah, I think, I think women generally have a little bit harder time just because of the the, the type of clothing, you're right, it's a little bit more form-fitting. Um, so, you know, it's w- when you go to the store, you know, to pick out clothes, like, bring your gun along. Don't leave it in the dressing room, uh, but bring your gun along. <laughs> That's a good tip. Try, try things out. Don't see, shoot the yeah. dressing yeah, room. Yeah, don't shoot the dressing room. Good point. Um, yeah, I mean, try it on. See how does it conceal well. You know, does this, does this fit? It's so much easier in the wintertime. It is. Because in the wintertime, you got like, I mean, you got your hoodie on with another long sleeve underneath that. Then you got a jacket on over it, and you just have so much more yeah. to conceal it with. But then the summertime comes along, you're in t shirts and shorts with a belt, and you're like, oh, well, now. Uh. Yeah. I mean, yeah, season and things like that. And obviously, that activity we talked about before can, can limit uh, what you do. And going back to the appendix carry, that's another thing I like about it, is because for the most part, I can kind of conceal it just with a T-shirt. Even with a T-shirt. Even with just a T-shirt, you know, darker colored T-shirt. I can look down and see, yeah, I'm not printing, things like that. Yeah. Unless your T-shirt says something like, I shoot guns a lot, <laughs> or in this house, we dial 1911. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah. We should talk about um, 
styles of, of holsters and, and also the material makeup of it. Because you have out in front of us Kydex and leather, and if I'm missing any other material, I don't know. Those are kind of the two main materials. Um, that That is, because my brother would give me a holster. God bless him, Jim. But I yeah. showed up to our class, and, and Pete was like, do you want me to throw that away for you, or should I? <laughs> <laughs> so apparently the materials and the style of holster are very important. That sounds like something Pete would say. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I think uh, regardless of what material you're getting is you have to have something where the mouth of the holster is going to stay open when you draw, right? It drives me nuts, like to the point where if we see oh, okay. somebody in a class who has like a floppy leather holster that collapses when they draw, like we don't we don't allow that. It's too dangerous. I was gonna, and is that more dangerous because of like re-engaging the pistol into the holster? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, because now you have to take your other hand, you have to hold the thing open and stick your pistol in. It's just a terrible idea. Um, I've even seen like some nylon holsters out there. Yeah, nylon. Ugh. Really bad, really really notorious for that. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. Um, for the most part, like you need to spend a little bit of money on a holster. Uh, going to the big box store and spending 15, 20 bucks on a holster probably is not a great idea. Um, there are a lot of really good quality holsters out there. Um, do some internet, re- well, do some internet research. Maybe I guess you got to take some of that with a grain of salt too. <laughs> Don't but just look at the first link that popped up. Exactly, yeah, exactly, yes. exactly. So I, I think that's a big one. Um, you know, material leather versus Kydex. I'm a big fan of Kydex. Yeah, uh, same I, here. I prefer Kydex. I think it's easier to draw from. Um, it's going to retain its shape. It's more durable. That one, uh, oh, that one still kind of keeps open. That's also yeah, a, this one, Adrian. I know, I know. Mm. That one's also kind of a more, of, more of that pocket that holster. You. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, actually, I used to carry this one. Um, Adrian's over here. It's not mine. It's not mine. No, I swear. Do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I used to carry this one on my vest uh, as a police officer, as a backup gun. So oh. this was a type of gun. Like, if I got this gun out, I probably wasn't worried about reholstering it at that point. So, uh, you know, something like this, again, a pocket holster. So pocket holsters might be the exception to that rule. I'm going to pull the thing out, and, I mean, it still stays open. I can reholster it carefully if I need to. But yeah. Okay, I interrupted. No, it's all right. Sorry. No, you're right. You're right. I was Cal- trying to just feel, I was like, okay, leather versus Kydex. Called, called me out on my hypocrisy. I'm okay <laughs> with that. I'm all right with that. Um, but, uh, yeah, for a primary carry, you've got to stay open. Uh, let's see. I said I like Kydex better than leather. That said, there are some good leather holsters out there. Um, but you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta look for them because there's a lot of crappy ones out there. There's some that are kind of a hybrid leather and Kydex, right? Yeah. And that I know I've experimented. I thought, what are they like a pancake or something like that? Is that what they're called? It's like a leather housing with, with, with a, a Kydex. Kydex insert or something like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm i I'm not a fan. I think I got one in my bag. I'm just going to leave it in there. I'm not a fan of them. Um, I found that, uh, they can be comfortable, but over time I found that the leather, will stretch at a different, well, Kydex doesn't stretch. Mm-hmm. So the retention level will uh, will change on them. So after a while, they'll start getting looser and things like that. Um, I don't think they fit the gun as well. Because you see all these holsters are are formed to both sides of the gun. Even this, this is a Milt Sparks. This is a really high quality leather holster. Um, but you can see it's 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 formed to both sides of the gun. Sure. Um, with, with those leather uh, uh, crossover styles, you just have a flat piece of leather and then the kydex is formed to the gun. So I don't think they fit as well, um, firearms. I, I found the retention level uh, or the tension level when you're holstering or drawing can be different, e- even depending on different type of clothes you wear. I'm not a fan of them. I really, how much you sweat. You yeah. Know, different things if they get wet, I, I really yeah. encourage people to stay away from them personally. That's, yeah, that that's was my own experience. Environmental factors like that, like uh, maybe it's raining or like you said you're 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 active and you're sweating yeah. um you know is that going to affect the integrity of the holster the other thing i like about most kydex holsters um so this is a this is a holster from tenacore uh the uh, tenacore makes great holsters i'm a big fan of them um i can adjust the tension on this holster too so if this gun is loose or tight i can uh you know i can tighten up those screws a little bit and uh you know yeah. adjust the tension so that's yeah. something i like about kydex too. I like Kydex too, just because the holster I'm running allows you to select the height in which the handgun sits above or below your waistband. So I'll show you guys this thing. And of course, I've, I'm printing obviously because I have a flag in my gun. But if I if I were to move this thing in one package, I got my firearm and I got my my uh, extra magazine. And just by selecting which holes I'm, I'm screwing the uh, the clips to the holster, yeah, 
I get a, a, a higher purchase on the handgun or it's it's almost where the belt's over the grip, not not really where I want to be. I just want to still be able to get my master grip. So it, uh, you definitely have options with something like this. And I've I've been running this kind of holster, gosh, um, the first time I ever carried concealed was the day I graduated the academy where my gun went from my duty holster to a leather holster just like that at the 3 o'clock. Mm-hmm. And um you know within within the year i made it on the swat team and i and i had to i had to go out and do things undercover and and and, and things like that and three o'clock in the leather holster just was not an option like i had to have it somewhere center lined where i can get to it quickly or at least it was more defendable for me um and that's when i started doing my research and landed on kydex i've only been able to break one of these and the company that i got that from um replaced it no questions asked and uh and did so in short fashion so Yep, I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, Kydex for that reason. Hmm. You've got you mentioned you've got a compartment there for an extra magazine yep. on yours. Uh, generally, something that you recommend most people do, or like it's 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 a it's are you just finding based. yourself in more like high round count gunfights than most folks <laughs> out there? Or? I <laughs> so just from my my time in the military, like I know what it's like to get short on rounds, and that's not something that I I ever hope to. to deal with in my civilian life so that's I totally just, fair yeah i carry so yeah I, I carry an extra mag in this holster and then i also have a pocket clip from neo mag that just hopes oh hold, that's cool yeah that holds an extra 22 round mag to my to my pocket essentially and i mean it's it's retaining the mag really well you know what i mean it's not just it's not going to get hit and like knock around in my in my pocket i have a, a reliable repeatable purchase on the magazine if, if if the time comes to to get hmm. there, so I mean, all in all, I'm sixty plus rounds, and I'm I. That's the way I roll. Backups for your backups. Yeah, that's right. Yep. What is yours? Does your appendix holster also have like a what's this thing that sticks out here with the dinosaur? Oh uh, yeah. It? Uh, so th- this Does is that from keep a, it straight. This is from a company called T Rex Arms, and without it, the essentially the the uh, frame of the handgun would just sit separated from the body a little more, and it might lead lead to printing. It might. Oh. It does yeah. it does allow you to get a, a better a better initial purchase on the handgun, but it does stick out and print a little more. This just ensures that the frame gets closer to your body, and okay. it actually almost makes it disappear. And and I mean, there's almost no print with this thing. I hadn't seen one of those before. Yeah, That's yeah. pretty so, sweet. Sometimes you see that this is a, a smaller. This is from a company called Bigfoot. Um, yep, friend similar of mine idea. Down in Janesville. Yep, makes these are pretty nice holsters. Um, so this has got kind of a, a wing on it. Same thing. It just pushes up against your belt and just tucks that that. Um, grip in so it doesn't print as much cool. okay yeah and then chris on yours your pistol you've got has a light on it and yeah. so that's something you need to consider ahead of time and also you've got a dot on yours too yes so red dot yes so this is something you got to consider ahead of time if i'm not mistaken when purchasing holsters um and is it like is it the kind of thing where if you option out a holster where you're like yeah yeah option with the light option it with a red dot but you don't have those things yet that the holster will still work or do you need to get the holsters specifically optioned out to your gun exactly as it's used all the time so it depends some manufacturers of these holsters will make the retention based on the on the light Mm. so in other words if i tried if i tried to holster this handgun without the light it's going to fit in there really loose because all the retention is based on on this guy oh okay i mean um now will it will it just sit in there sure but i wouldn't trust you know, oh yeah, yeah. Because the tension is set around this guy. Now there are other Noted. companies out there that that set the tension to the handgun, and you can carry with him without the light. Okay, but, yeah, got it. Yeah, it's all going to depend. A lot of these, I mean, I think most of these holsters here, these four here, um, they're all designed to be able to take most red dots, and you know they work fine without. Gun yeah, the red okay. The red dot thing came into play. I know it was it was earlier on. I feel like when the red dot craze, so to speak, on pistols first got started, but I think they had to shave some of the kydex usually away on the top that was running into red dot housings and stuff. Yeah. So this this is the this is the replacement holster I got. Uh, the first I had an older version of this same holster that I broke, and that's just because I think I was either wrestling around with the kids one day and I, I got all my weight on this one point and it, and it broke right here at the trigger guard. Mm-hmm. But again, uh, those guys replaced it and I had a new one within 48 hours. You know what I mean? Um, so the, the, again, it, it's, it's just all about 
uh, and, and yeah, so with, with the with the red dot and the light, it, th- those are options that you have to have picked out ahead of time. Mm-hmm. So and you know a lot of, a lot of these options are like light specific, so you have to know which light you're gonna have, and if if you want a knob to cut or not. A yeah. lot of, a lot of companies are making optic cuts just the thing like they don't kind of just the standard the mm-hmm. standard right because yeah. it seems like i mean if you don't get the optic cut the only thing you're getting is just a little bit of extra kydex up over the frame right. and back part of the slide right. which it's uh, w- i guess what is that preventing maybe it from getting caught on your yeah, shirt I mean, sometimes something? sometimes you'll have a little bit bigger of a sweat guard mm-hmm. or something like that up there which can be nice okay um, but so sometimes they got to trim that away a little bit depending on what the optic is but for the most part there's not a lot of difference. Yeah. yeah. No. And I think, honestly, on the last one, it, it wasn't optic cut ready. All I had to do was just shave maybe a, like an like an eighth or so of, of of material with my Dremel in it, and it was in there just fine. Just shave some uh, material oh, off you're, the you're optic. Off your optic. optic. Smith. Yeah, off the, uh, yeah, off yeah. the optic, yeah. <laughs> just, just take a little glass off there and it yeah. fit just fine. Fellow yeah. gunsmith in here. Yeah. I didn't realize. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Chris can run a mean Dremel. Oh, yeah. Wow. Experienced gunsmith. (laughs) Um, Master level, in fact. You know, I'll say one thing that is, in some ways, like, impressive, surprising. When you pulled that out, like, when you came in, I saw you, and, like, there wasn't anything, like, conspicuous. I wasn't like, oh, my gosh, Chris is... Except for that weird chamber flag sticking out of his belly button. There's (laughs) there's that part, I think it was sitting there like that. I thought maybe it was just, you know, a (laughs) growth. I wasn't going to ask too many questions. (laughs) Right. You don't want to be impolite. It's a sensitive subject, guys. But, uh, like... There's actually a lot of substance, a lot of equipment there, but very, I mean, you've got, you know, pistol, like essentially, I mean, that looks like a full size pistol to me. Yeah, that's um, just to Just to finish off, like, I have a, a handheld light. I, I've always felt that if you're going to be running one of these, you should or better have one of these because I'm not going to help, gra- you know, grandma or anyone look for their license in their bag with my handheld light because it's attached to my gun right oh yeah so, hey let me help you find that real quick yeah here yeah, yeah sorry. brandish your no, and then i've, I've got a folder of course and of my wallet and then my keys and that's pretty much it that's everything i carry and then of course you know if i also remember i i don't have it in my pocket now but i'll, I'll throw a tourniquet like in a back pocket that's super easy and, and it doesn't take up a lot of room but that's that's Essentially, my everyday carry. If you can I make a hole, what, you better know how to fix a hole. Look, yep. at all, look at all this stuff. It reminds me of, I think, is that the movie Police Academy? Or the guy <laughs> just like, <laughs> we just saw like the actual living version of Police where they just like keep yeah. pulling stuff pulling off. Pulling weapons and stuff out, yeah. What's but that it, Police Academy? Is it in it? Like, there's a movie too where there's like a kid and they say, all right, empty your pockets. And he, he winds up pulling like an AK 47 out of his pocket. And yeah. Wasn't it Tackleberry? I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't believe I'm remembering that. You sparked that. Good, a good movie. There, if you're Mark. if you're into good cinema, that is check out the old Police Academy. That, yeah. that and smoking. Anyway, gun. where, where yeah. I was going with that though was like a lot of stuff going on there. I mean, your holster fits a spare mag, but it's not like from the outside in. It wasn't like super obvious, I guess. I think it brings up a good point. Most people can carry a pretty decent sized gun if you have a good method of carrying it. I think there's kind of a tendency, a lot of people want to get these really small guns that are easy to carry. And I understand it's it's comfortable, right? But at the same time, you also have to weigh that balance. How good can I shoot this really small gun, right? Um, a bigger gun, you're going to be able to shoot better, you know, hands down. It's just yeah. it, less recoil, uh, you know, counter easier intuitive. to grip. Yeah. At so, first, yep. counterintuitive. Um, you, you mentioned something earlier adrian and you're saying you know primary kind of like primary versus secondary or something like that um when what are situations where a person may want to carry two guns or why would they want to carry two guns and i guess where where are you putting the other one yeah i mean that uh, it all depends is it, it a good idea it, it can be you know there's the old saying two is one one is none um uh, plain clothes or or, or or as a as a private citizen uh, i i don't I, I carry one uh, I've got a knife and and I you know I figure I have a reliable gun to start with mm-hmm. um as a police officer yeah I carried I carried two and a lot of the cops I worked with did um but I think you're in that situation it's just a little bit higher risk right you're actually going out looking for you know <laughs> kind of looking for trouble that's your job right 
So I don't know. Yeah, some people do. I've known some people who do. Uh, personally, it's it's a risk, right? Risk versus the hassle of carrying, um, I guess, judgment. So some people absolutely feel better having a, a backup, and, uh, man, I, I get it. That's cool. If something for me I, I don't. I don't personally find necessary, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, same here. I I think the only time I've ever physically carried two guns is if, like, I'm essentially my wife's holster, right? So I've got – I'm carrying appendix, and I'm carrying maybe not this huge holster, but whatever she's got, I'll throw it in there, and I'm essentially her holster for her. So she can be more hands-free and not have to worry. And now she can just come up behind me, unzip, and now she's she's in the fight as well. So Right on. Yeah, but that's really – yeah, that's really it. You wouldn't do the old like uh, ankle holster for your second micro gun, like the old uh, casino well, under the table special. Yeah. yeah. So my thing with that is you have to consider: Do you have continuity with your primary, right? Or am I going to have to carry now a second set of magazines just for that for that handgun? Oh or yeah, a separate, one's a, a nine, separate one's caliber, a right? Three eighty or right, whatever. Right. So I mean, if you're calling that your last ditch effort, then I guess what's in the gun is is all you have. So I, yeah. I've known I've I've known fellow cops who carried revolvers in there and you know those six rounds that that was it that that's their Alamo, so certainly an option. I've never tried the ankle. I Is that either. one of those ones that you would crap on? No, not necessarily. <laughs> no, not necessarily. Shoulder holsters would be another one I'd crap on, I think. But um, <laughs> Jim, I'm not going to crap wanna, on that, but yeah. I will crap on this. <laughs> <laughs> unless you want to go for the Miami Vice uh, thing. Um, yeah, ankle holsters. Um, some guys I know have, have carried them. I, I tried carrying it as a as a backup gun on duty for a while. Um, I, I find the more stuff you put on your legs, the harder it is to run, which you know mm. might be your primary uh, primary method of defending yourself. Um, it's it's you lose all mobility when you're drawing. You have to stop. You have to get down uh, to draw from it. Uh, if you crank your two, if you're clumsy and you crank your gun off your ankle it hurts like it hurts like hell um so and i think you're kind of limited uh by what size gun you can carry on there so i've done it i'm not a big fan of it personally it works for some people but i think there's some there's some disadvantages of it too if you're now if you're wearing like a suit or something like that or that's your only option you know a gun down there might be better than the gun you leave at home so Mm -hmm. but you know even in a suit now maybe not this option but like an option like adrian has where it's a standalone without without the spare magazine, I can definitely get away with concealing something like this, even appendix, where I have the clips on the belt, but I tuck the shirt in all around, and no one's the wiser. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've and I've done it a bunch. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and crap on that shoulder one. I'm curious. Yeah, shoulder holsters. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of shoulder holsters. Um, yeah, I mean, number one, I think they're bulky. Um, it really limits what type of clothing you can wear. I mean, they work with a blazer or a jacket, but that's about it. You know, when you're drawing, you're muzzling people behind you. A lot of times you're muzzling yourself. Um, oh, yeah. There's some important th- stuff there in that arm right yeah. on the inside. Yep. They're they're bulky. Um, there's just there's just a lot better ways to do it. Uh, they're expensive. Yeah. The only time I've ever seen a uh, shoulder holster, like, be a thing is for, like, officers that were on their way to the chow hall. Like, yeah. that's where it's they like, would... And that's that was their check in the box to carry a gun. It's the detective uh, carry. Yeah. Sorry just, to, for all the detectives out there. No disrespect to any officers out there. <laughs> yeah. Enlisted man. So yeah, but yeah, shoulder holsters are to each his own. <laughs> As I said, it was I don't know. It was cool in the in the eighties. It so. does. It looks real Miami good with Vice. every Ferrari. bad guy in you the eighties. You know 80s. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, there, that's a good rule. If you own a red Ferrari, I, there's no other way to you carry. can you can carry in a shoulder holster. Otherwise, waterfront property on Miami. Yeah, man, exactly. knock yourself out. No. Wouldn't give you any crap for it. <laughs> yeah. So there's some pre- prerequisites. Then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Some I would lifestyle say. things yeah, going check on. Some boxes. You yep. Yeah. <laughs> got it. Got it. What? Like you, we've talked a little bit too about about printing. You know, Chris did his pocket dump here. A surprising amount of things in his pockets. Um, I know you were also talking earlier to Adrian about how sometimes you you start carrying, you get a little self conscious about it. You're checking it a lot. Like, what are some of these cues? Printing wise, or or body language, or checking things, or whatever, fiddling with stuff. What are some of these cues that people do a lot of times? Where, you know, savvy eyes would be instantly like, "Yep, gun." Yeah, I th- I think the main one that I see is the um, 
I, I forgot what we called security it. Pat. Security pat. Security yep. pat, yep. Um, and we see that a lot with guys who are carrying either illegal guns or, or drugs and stuff like that. If you're self-conscious about it, and you it, you want to keep checking to make sure it's there. A lot of times it's a self-conscious thing. Mm-hmm. It's just, okay, is that still there? Is it? Or you see people get out of their car when they change position. They stand up. They do something like this. You know, it's not a dead giveaway that someone has a gun, but, um, you know, that, that's a behavior you, you see frequently. Yeah. So trying not to do those security pats. Um, obviously, you know, printing can, can be a big one, but there's a lot of other stuff that people carry on their belts too. So just because somebody has a little bulge there doesn't necessarily mean it's a gun. Yeah. You know? I feel like you're almost less likely to get, to get um, made, if you will, for a little slight printing versus all the security pat and check stuff. I, I would say printing on, on its own kind of leaves a lot like is it or not you know but if you get printing and some sort of security pad or some other pre-assaultive behavior that you observe in someone then you're like okay yeah that they're start adding up the clues right it's a Mm -hmm. a totality more more than it's just the one thing yeah and the thing you have to realize is like 99 percent of the people out there are walking around completely oblivious to anything that's going around right uh you could probably carry a gun openly and most people aren't even going to notice I have such a good story related to but people not knowing to sing anything. I'll some people in will. Oh, you yeah, know, 100%. Cops and criminals, like, you know, are going to be the guys who notice that kind of stuff. That's what I was going like to say. Is like Other pe- carriers. People with your background, like, you know what to look for. And also, I think you probably have a heightened situational awareness. So you're just kind of like it's like part of your MO, right? Like, just kind of what, what you're doing all the time. But to the everyday person, they're not actively, I guess, you know, analyzing or assessing those things. So, yeah. I think a lot of a lot of us if we're if we're really truly being honest with ourselves we pick up on things and a lot of a lot of it might be coined off as my gut is telling me or just something isn't right it's listen to those things you know what i mean because oftentimes the, those instincts can you know even if you don't have a title for them or don't know what they are they can keep you alive or keep you out of some really really bad stuff yeah, yeah absolutely i have a funny story about how oblivious people are these days I was, um, so I drive a manual transmission, I always have, and I was rushing one day, coming home from work, had to go by Home Depot. So I run inside, like I pull the car in the parking lot, I found a spot pretty up close to the front, pull the car in, turn it off, jump out, run in Home Depot, grab everything I need, and I was rushing, I can't remember why, but my wife needed me home, like there was like a dinner thing we had to go to or something like that. So I go through the checkout line, and I had to have not been in there more than a couple minutes. I come back out, and I'm kind of doing the old like fast jog back to my car. And I look at where I parked, and my car wasn't there. And um, I, I thought, oh, my gosh. It finally happened to me. I <laughs> am the victim of Grand Theft Auto. This is it. And so I'm walking closer and closer, and there was two big SUVs parked on either side of me. So I was like, ah, it's probably just, I didn't pull all the way up to the curb, but I get closer and closer and closer. And it's very evident that it is not in my parking spot anymore. And I'm now heart racing. So I sprint at this point, get to the spot and it is gone. And I'm, I'm like frantic. I look to my right and out in the middle of the home Depot parking lot. And, and, (laughs) and it had, it had crossed. It it makes me sick to to (laughs) reminisce. (laughs) It had crossed not only the one lane, uh, but also through two more parking spots and into the next one. Uh, after work, so we're talking like five thirty, wow. and Home Depot, and I don't know. I mean, this is like soup. This is so bad because I think of like how many people I could have rolled over with that, cars I could have hit, damage that could have been caused. Didn't hit anything. Didn't hit a of course. thing. Wow. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I I'm. By the time I get to my car, there's going to be a bunch of angry people. There's going to be a crowd <laughs> gathering around. Who knows? The cops might be showing up, whatever, because like this, you know, somebody had to dive out of the way of it. I run over to my car. People are people are walking around the vehicle, very clearly not turned on, no lights on, no engine sound, nothing. They're walking around the vehicle. There's cars trying to back out of their parking spots that are like maneuvering around it awkwardly and driving it around it. And I'm looking around, and it was it was as though I was in one of those movies where you've been transplanted back in time, and you're like a, a fly on the wall, but like nobody knows you're there, because nobody looked at me funny, nobody looked at my car, everybody was just walking around it like it wasn't even there. And I threw my stuff in the passenger seat, like jumped in, turned the car on, and drove out. And I'm like, no one noticed that. 
the unmanned car slowly <laughs> rolling across the parking lot. Yeah, that's yeah really that, sad. that it doesn't surprise me. And I've um, got a lot of stories like that actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Since then, I'm uh, extremely self conscious about setting the parking, parking brake, brake and putting it in gear. But uh, <laughs> I mean, I always have been. I don't know what happened that day, but anyway, <laughs> that that is. That is a pretty crazy. I can't believe it didn't hit anything. That's oh, interesting, yeah, though, <laughs> too, because there's another moral, moral of that story that, sick that parallels, and that's if you're in a hurry, you're distracted about things, like you can make mistakes. Oh, yeah. You know, so you can leave your house with an unloaded gun. You can, you know, leave your gun in a dressing room or a bathroom or something like that mm-hmm. yep. if you're not focused on your thing, especially um, when you've carried so long and you've handled guns long enough where it just it's second nature and you really you don't think about it anymore i mean you should be thinking about it but it's just a gun is a a normal part of my wardrobe like my keys or my wallet or anything like that like you got to remember to slow down and and think about that stuff because it's not like leaving your keys behind now you're leaving a loaded gun behind somewhere so no bueno yeah not cool i think we talked about this before but is that i mean if you're going to carry is that an everyday thing like is that I mean is is it is is it like your keys is it your wallet it just has to become that otherwise you're maybe going to be p- more prone to making those you know yeah. I guess mental errors where oh yeah I don't carry my gun every day so I'm not used to having it and I left it on the back of the toilet I, I think it is and I think I think Pete mentioned this in a in a previous podcast right you just, if you're going to carry a gun carry it everywhere you can you know everywhere you can legally um, everywhere you can practically if you're making decisions about oh you know. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the mall today, so I'm gonna carry my gun. Like, well, maybe that's a sign you just shouldn't go to the mall, <laughs> right. you know. Um, and the other thing too is like, don't don't over rely on the gun as the weapon, right? Your your mind is the weapon, okay. And there are some places that you're gonna have to go where you can't carry a gun, right? Um, it's illegal or uh, you can't because of security or things like that. Um, so don't let the gun be your primary line of defense. The gun is just a tool. Okay, you mm-hmm. need to maintain your situational awareness, uh, situational awareness, uh, have a plan, uh, be aware of your environment, you know, things like that. So, yep. In the same way that we wouldn't go anywhere without our phones these days, you know, that's kind of the way I treat my handgun. Yet, we all spend so much time on, ha- on, on our phones that we all our attention gets sucked into them, and now we lose our, the entire world. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just, it's, it really comes back to awareness and knowing what to look for. Like I said, you know, a lot of times your gut is telling you this doesn't feel right. This person staring at me from across the parking lot just doesn't feel right. Like you, you need to be listening to those instincts because they're we are programmed with them for a reason. And when that person is staring at, is that like when you you like what, like something like that? That's yeah. when you exactly Usually an aggressive gesture. What are you looking at, punk? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's exactly it. <laughs> Not do that. We're, that's, we're kidding. Oh, yeah, don't. We're kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Anything else that you guys feel like we didn't ask that is worth worth going into for concealed carry styles or methods or you know don't be afraid to try out different holsters. Yep. I've got a, a box. I mean, this is a fraction of the holsters I have, and these are actually all pretty good ones. Um, I've got a buy. I probably got fifty holsters that I've tried over the years, and you know, um, you try one method of carry, uh, it doesn't work for you. You don't like the holster, get a different one. You know, try different things out. Find what works for you. Um, oh, uh, get a good belt. I think a good belt is as uh, important as a good holster. Yeah, I think we've mentioned it before on other podcasts, but absolutely, don't carry, don't carry a, a real nice holster and a really cruddy belt. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, your your system is only as good as your weakest link. Is there a way to try out those different holsters other than I buying gonna, fifty? I was going to say that. You know, we're spoiled here. You know, because uh, we we have so much ex- experience and. And so many trial and error hours that that have gone into what 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 we select, but that does allow us to give our guests and our students a unique experience, right? They they can come here and they have questions um, before you make a purchasing experience. Like I said, go go train, and if you train with us, if you sign up for a course, you're getting all those countless hours of trial and error, and to you know this is the thing, this is what we're doing. And this is what works for us. So. Years and years of mistakes yes, we've made. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yep. It is helpful to draw on that. I also, um, you brought up the belt. That's a super good thing, I think, to bring up. And um, I feel like uh, I remember there was a litmus test. I can't remember if one of you guys said it or if I saw it somewhere else. But if you can fold your belt basically in half, hot dog style, if you will, 
Yeah, I'll take my Not off. really Ooh, a good there we sign. Go. Any excuse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the, yeah, this is a blue alpha belt that I've had now for, gosh, I don't know, five, six years now. And it's still rigid. I can stand on this thing and not fold it. It yeah. looks lightweight too. Like I was expecting oh, it is, something yeah. to be like, oh man, now I got to carry this robust thing. I had to. I had to see. I tried a couple of those belts with the quick release clip thing, and like they're they're more of like a nylon-y or something material. And I just couldn't get behind it. And I've always worn a leather belt, so I ended yeah. up going on and finding uh, one of these. Well, why not? Hey, if we're hey, having a party, there we go. Yeah, let's go. Right, uh, take it off. I found one of these. It's a Hank's belt. That's a great oh. belt. And they yeah. you can't. Yep. Like yeah. They're they're hefty belts, and I mean, if you get one of the ones that's designed for carrying, literally, I can't even begin to bend it. I probably look like a weakling if you're watching a video. Right <laughs> yeah, there are. There, I mean, yeah. there are specific companies that make gun belts. I've got a yeah. buddy, um, All Soccer Custom Leather. He makes. Uh, he's a deputy here locally. He makes really nice leather belts. They're dress belts, like you can wear it as a dress belt, and it's nice. designed as a gun belt. You know, super good stitching and and you know, really stiff like that. So yeah, if you look, you can find the right stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've got I've got one question. Send it. If you were gonna pick like you're all around, like you're all all around, which I think I know the way you're gonna pick that you're gonna carry, but like size of gun, like yeah, there's a lot of ways you can do it. There's small guns, there's full size guns, there is intermediate guns. I mean, is it kind of like you know when we talk about rings here, it's like get the medium height, it's gonna work. Like, do you get the medium size? Is that gonna be the best of all worlds, or is it just so? It depends so, on your body. Hey, yeah, it really depends on what you can get away with. I, 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 I've accepted the fact that, you know, since I tend to do some push-ups and, and eat the way I do, I can get away with certain things that someone that maybe doesn't eat as much as I do can't get away with, right? So for me, me personally, I wouldn't carry anything smaller than, you know, just for a size reference in a Glock 19, right? So that's why I've, I've kind of landed on this Glock 45 because it's got a bigger frame, which I can get away with because of this this raptor claw and i can carry this comfortably and know that i'm not going to print you mm-hmm. know what i mean i can okay. get enough of my my gigantic hands uh, to on the gun and i'm, I'm going to control it really well do some push-ups and eat your wheaties and you can yes. carry a bigger gun yeah. yes i mean i would say good <laughs> Moral advice story yeah. good advice is carry carry the largest gun you comfortably can um that you can shoot well Okay. So, yeah. I mean, for me, same thing. It's kind of a Glock 19. I have a 43X on today because I sit in an office chair a lot now. So I've downsized it a little bit. But, I mean, if I had to pick one gun, it would probably be uh, a Glock 19 uh, in an appendix holster. What's the 43X now? So the 43X is, um, let's see, it is, it's a 43, but it's got longer frame, longer, frame, or longer grip. Longer grip. Longer grip. So it's got the, the slide longer is still grip. short. Yep. Versus the 48, which has got the, that's the one with the longer. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So um, it's just a little bit thinner and you can get, I forgot who makes them, but I have uh, 15 round, some 15 round mags for it. So I'm oh, not, not limited to 10 rounds. There's an aftermarket company that makes some metal 15 round mags. So that's, that's pretty groovy. I feel pretty good. I can still shoot it pretty good. Not as good as my 19, um, but like I feel it'll do the, do the job. Right So, on. yeah. Cool. Well, good stuff, guys. Appreciate it. That yeah, was fun. Yeah, appreciate it. Super informative. No yeah, thanks everybody for listening. And like we said, I alluded to a couple of times, these guys are from Vortex Edge. So if it hasn't popped up yet or you haven't seen anything just yet, stay tuned. It's very shortly, you're going to start seeing some classes and things that are coming available. Uh, and and again, um, they're invaluable tools to becoming more and more comfortable with the firearms that we use or carry or, uh, or compete with, whatever it is. So um, check it out for sure. Uh, yeah. Sweet. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you. you bet. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.